Got Palm Sunday. Okay. Oh my goodness. I'm a train wreck up here. Okay. I, I'm not even gonna draw the palm. On this. <laughs> okay. All right. Palm Sunday. What else? What else happens? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Send their disciples. The donkey. That's right. Pull. Yep. Okay. What else? Celebrate Passover. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. What else? What else? Goes to the garden and prays. Are you cheating? No, I just closed. Go to the garden. I go to the garden. Oh, yeah, exactly. Like the song. Okay, in the garden. Yeah. Go to the garden. Okay. Goes to trial. Say what? Goes to trial. Goes to trial. All right, what else? Judas betrays. Okay, Judas betrays him. Okay. All right. What else? Peter denies him. So you got a betrayal and you got a denial. All right. All right. What else? Okay. Carries the cross. All right. Gonna make sure this doesn't fall on me. What else? Crucified, buried, and rose again. Okay, crucified, buried, rose again. You sound like someone's got the creed down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Now we there's a lot more than this. I'm just I'm just gonna I'm helping us kind of think about it right now. Anything else to think of right now? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. There you go. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And then he also forgave. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Gave his mother to. Okay. Gave, gave mother, yep. Yep. Mother, behold your son. Behold your mother. All right. Any others? You know so much here at this time. So I just want us to get, get thinking here, and we're going to walk through it. It's a lot to walk through. All right? Now, what's, um, before we kind of jump in, here's what's interesting, is that it's Holy Week. Now, I hadn't thought about this that much until just the past couple of years. And at least one of you will get excited about this. But I didn't think about this that much, honestly, until we said Revelation, because what is a week? How many days is a week? Seven. Oh my goodness, we have seven. You have a Seven, it's a week. This is Holy Week. And in Scripture, oh, that's why we got a problem. Hey. All right. In Scripture, you have holy places and you have holy times. You have holy places and you have holy times. So Christmas and Easter are one of those obvious times we think of as special set-aside times. Now, the way spaces and times are holy are different in a certain way in the Old Testament than they are now. We're not going to get into all that now, but just to say they're holy places and they're holy times. You know that in ancient times, well, older times, in the Middle Ages, in most Christian kingdoms, if not all of them, you could not fight on Good Friday. You had to put all your weapons away. Um, there's a story of one of King Arthur's knights who didn't know anything about Jesus, grew up in the woods, Percival. You know, Percival. And he, he's in the woods one day, and he's, he has a sword, and he just became a knight. And, and people came by and they said, whoa, you, you shouldn't have your, your sword on you today. What are you doing? And he goes, what do you mean? And they said, well, it's Good Friday. 
It's like, yeah, it is a good Friday, but what do you mean good Friday? They say, no, 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 it's the day Christ died for us and goes, who's Christ? But the, the point is, is there's, there's, it's understood you don't fight on this day. This is the day he died for us. You can even think of not too long ago, 100 years ago, this in the, well, a little longer than that, World War I, the great Christmas truce, right? On Christmas Day, and, and no general commanded this, but they celebrated Christmas, and as a result, there was no fighting on that day. The reason I'm bringing this up is just to say there's something special about these days that we celebrate what he's done for us. Okay? And, uh, and, and part of this goes all the way back to Genesis 1, the Sabbath. The Sabbath is holy, right? So there's a day every week that's holy and set aside, it's special. And um, and so so again, there's holy places and there's holy times in the Bible. And again, it's a little different how it works in the Old Testament versus the New. And um, and so this is Holy Week that we're we're going to look at the last day of, of uh, his early ministry. And of course, the two days we know the most in that for good reason is as uh, Tammy said, uh, cross burial resurrection suit Friday. Sunday. Those are the main days we think of. Um, but he was doing a ton of things, a ton of, uh, there are events happening every single day, and that's what we're going to walk through. I'm going to give this teaser right now, and we're going to come back to it. But remember how we've said over and over again that every detail of the Bible, God had it that way on purpose. And I love the way one pastor put it, he doesn't waste his breath. So, God didn't write the Bible with his own hand, but he inspired human authors to write it. But he inspired it in such a way that every detail matters. And in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are little hints that this last week of Jesus' life mirrors the first week in Genesis. Okay, why? Because in Genesis, it's creation. Seven days. In a holy week, that's what's happening. It's the new creation in seven days. All right? That's really cool. So we're going to just remember that. We're going to come back to that at the end if we have time. You know how I am. But we're going to come back to that. So as we walk through what happened each day, in the back of your mind, be thinking about the seven days of creation. And we're going to come back. Some of these, as far as I've looked at it, it's hard to see the seven days of creation in some of these, but it's, it's easier in others. So again, just have that in the back of your mind. Okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to mainly look at uh, the Gospel of Mark. And part of why is because the Gospel of Mark is the shortest gospel, um, it's just easier to walk through it. Of course, there's more in Matthew and Luke and John. Um, and also because Mark... For interestingly, Mark is the only gospel that with this last day of Jesus' life, Mark actually gives us the details of it was Sunday, and then now it's the next day, it's Monday, and now it's the evening, and now it's the next day, and now it's the morning, and now it's the evening, and now it's Wednesday, and then now it's Thursday. Mark is the only one that actually gives us the markers to know which day is which day uh, for these seven days, okay? Or for these eight days. So that's why I'm going to look at it. Matthew, or sorry, Mark, excuse me, and Mark, so, start at Mark 11, where did I put that Bible, I don't even know, what, oh, there it is, oh, Mark 11, Okay. All right, and again, remember, there are more details in, in if we looked at all the Gospels, there'd be more detail, but look, we're trying to cover uh, a whole week, a number of chapters tonight, so... 
I can't hit all of them, so we're just going to kind of stick to, to Mark um, mainly tonight. So, Mark chapter 11. And this is what we're going to look at this, um, this coming Sunday. We're actually going to look at Matthew, but, uh, but we're, right now we're looking at Mark. So we'll look at Palm, uh, the, tr- Palm Sundays this coming Sunday. Um, so hear this scripture. Lord, we ask that you speak to us uh, through your word, we pray by the power of your spirit. Amen. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, Its master needs it, and he will send it back right away. They went and found a colt tied to a gate outside the street. They untied it. Some people standing around said to them, Why are you doing, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them just what Jesus said, and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. Many people spread out their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes, is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of your ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. All right. So, there's so much here, and I'm going to preach on this this Sunday, so I don't want to give you too much of a, a preview. But here he comes. Man, I'm not. Wow. All right. Let's, let's, let's see. Let's see. Here's the city. <laughs> Here's the temple. Um, something like that. And... I don't know. This is not good. City gates. <laughs> All right, here's the Mount of Olives. And here he is. Here he is coming. Here's a donkey. You're going to like the donkey. All right, here he comes. Okay, now, why is this important? Why is this important? Um, there's a lot of things here. Does anyone remember from your personal Bible study some, some details here? He rides on a donkey. The book of Zechariah talks about the Messiah is going to come on a donkey. And as we've looked at in our previous Bible studies, what's, what's amazing is a lot of times when the Old Testament talks about, has some uh, prophecy that then the New Testament picks up and talk, it, it's pointing to Jesus. Sometimes, a lot of times in the Old Testament, if it's one of the books that's the end of the Old Testament, it's actually something that there's an earlier prophecy that then points forward, and then a later prophet then writes about it, and then it points forward again. So imagine if you, okay, you're tying your shoe. Let's say, this is not a great example. If you're, if, you have to put new shoelaces in. You know how you have to thread them through every eye? Imagine if that thread is the thread of prophecy that runs through the Old Testament. And each eye that we thread it through is a different book of the Bible. It's like the same uh, prophetic uh, revelations are going through each book. So the, my point is, is that Zechariah says he has to ride on a donkey. But then you ask, why does the donkey matter? And a little preview, because I'm going to give this more sermon. Do you know that when Saul was called to be king, the first king, do you remember one of the first stories of Saul? Samuel asked him, I think it was Samuel asked him, go and find the donkeys that your father lost. And then, do you remember when um, David, right before David died, and he wanted to ensure that Solomon took the throne, he said, Solomon, I want you to ride out on my mule. In the book of Judges, a lot of the judges rode on donkeys. Now for us, we think donkeys, and for good reason, are kind of clunky, ugly, uh, cumbersome animals. But in the Old Testament, they were the animals of royalty. So, him riding on a donkey would be like me flying an Air Force One. If I'm flying Air Force One, what does that tell you? I'm either the President of the United States or I work for 
right? So it does. He's coming into Jerusalem on Air Force One. Watch out! Here's Air Force One. All right. So everyone and everyone would have known. The Book of Zechariah also, and I, I totally forgot this until this past week. Um, but the Book of Zechariah also says, chapter fourteen, verse four. We're not going to go into it, but it says, listen to this: that the Messiah is going to come into Jerusalem from. The Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is only mentioned in the Old Testament two or three times. And one of those times is Zechariah saying, the Messiah is going to come from the Mount of Olives, from the east. Now why does that matter, from the east? Because, again, every detail matters. And Mark wants to say, look, he approached Jerusalem from Bethphage and from Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Why is he going to tell us Bethphage and Bethany? Because he's making this track coming from the east to Jerusalem. Don't, don't make any mistake. He's coming from the east. And why is that? As soon as I say it, you'll go, oh my gosh. And I, I had to look this up, and I actually just today just, just learned this, or re relearned this. Do you remember in the book of Ezekiel, it says that when God's presence left the temple, it left and went east. And that later Ezekiel says that when the presence of God returns, the presence of God will come from the east. So, could it be that Messiah Jesus on Air Force One coming from the east, what does that mean? It means the presence is coming. And how do I know that? Because what does Mark say right after he comes in? He comes in on the donkey. What does it say? Verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem. And what's the first thing he did immediately? Immediately. He went into the temple. And after looking around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. He was focused on the temple. The book of Luke, or yeah, Gospel of Luke, chapter 9 says, He set his face in Jerusalem. He was set on Jerusalem. And Luke, it says, No prophet died outside of Jerusalem. He set on it. He set in everything on Jerusalem. I gotta go there. And why does he have to go there? Because he's gotta go to the temple. Why does he have to go to the temple? Because he needs to flip those tables as a prophetic action and say, This thing is coming down. But I am the new temple, and I'm never gonna be brought down. So. That, that's uh, so that, that's what happens on Palm Sunday, and then it says because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany. Now here's what's interesting: if you look, and as we look tonight, Jesus only spends the night in Jerusalem once, only once. You know that? Well, maybe twice technically. His trial, and then his death. And that's it. Before that, he's there during the day, like coming in on the night. But at night, he always leaves. He doesn't stay there. He always leaves. He, he goes back. He goes back to another hall. He, he retreats back. He retreats back every night. So, um, so then we move to Monday. So then Monday, verse 12, it says the next day. So here's the next day. After leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Jesus was hungry. Which help, you know, reminds us of his humanity. He became man, a human being just like us. He got hungry like we do. He got sleepy like we do. He got thirsty like we do. He was hungry. And so what happens? What happens, somebody? That fig tree. Right? You know, don't talk, don't, don't. There's someone in this room who has a cursed fig tree at home, but I'm not saying anything. Um, but anyway, they, they had a fig tree that got a, a little whiff there. <laughs> All right, so he was hungry. And from far away, he noticed the fig tree and leaf. So he went to see if he could find anything on it. 
And when he came to it, he found nothing except leaves, since he wasn't, it wasn't the season for figs. So he said to it, No one will ever eat of your fruit again. And his disciples heard this. They came into Jerusalem, and after entering the temple... All right. So, first, fig tree. And then, right after that, he goes to the temple. All right? Now, this is important. These things are connected. And as we see tonight, as we see each day, as we see this is Sunday, this is Monday, this is Tuesday, this is Wednesday, when you look at them as units, as days, and then you put them together as a week, you'll start to understand it better. This is on the same day he curses the fig tree and he goes into the temple. Now, hold on a second. Are you saying that he curses the fig tree and then he curses the temple? Yeah. So wait a second. If he curses the fig tree and then he curses the temple, does that mean there's a connection between the, the, the fig tree and the temple? Yeah. Now, it doesn't say he, it doesn't literally say he curses the fig tree, but he flips the table. He, he has a, a, a judgment on that temple. And uh, in the Old Testament, God, uh, Israel is called a vine over and over again. Isaiah 3 and 4. Um, Psalm 80, Israel is a vine. And sometimes that vine is even talked about as a, uh, a fig tree. Remember, uh, was it Nathaniel, right? Under the fig tree. You know, I saw you. You know, this is Israelite whom there's no God. That's not a coincidence. He's under the fig tree. The fig tree represents Israel. Okay? Now, when he, now what does God always want to ask of us? Are you bearing fruit? Are you bearing fruit? Are you bearing fruit? And when he sees the fig tree doesn't have any fruit, he curses it. So, what happens when he goes to the temple? There's no fruit. And there hasn't been fruit for like 700 years. Okay? You see the connection now? Now, when you go into the temple, you know what you would see? You see that. You actually see, I think, seven of those, right? The menorah, right? And the menorah, <clears throat> what does it look like? We've talked about this. What does it look like? Huh? A tree. You see the connection? They all knew this. There was even, on the menorah, the Old Testament talks about there were pieces on it that were the same words that have to do with almond trees. The same, this is a tree, and this is a tree. Why? Because when you go in here, you're going into the garden. Garden, tree, garden, tree. Right? That's where it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be the people of the new Eden. But no fruit was here, and no fruit was here. You see that connection? And so when Jesus curses this fig tree, as one pastor said, when he did that, you can imagine, these disciples were probably teenagers, you can imagine them going, whoa, he did that. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know? Whoa, I can't believe he did that. Okay, that would be like, um, okay, here's an example. Here's an example. If I saw a bald eagle, and I said, bald eagle, you have failed in justice and freedom. And, 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 and goodness. Yeah. Whoa, hold on. Is he just talking about the eagle? Or is he talking about the United States? You see that connection? Same thing here. But everyone would have known that. Everyone would have known it then. But because we're separated by 2,000 years, it's, it's, it's harder to see it. But now we can see it. Okay? So that's, that's Monday. And then, so he goes to the temple, he throws out those who are selling and buying, he pushes over the tables used for currency exchange and the chairs of those sold doves. He didn't allow anyone to carry anything to the temple. He taught them, hasn't it been written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've turned it into a hideout 
for thieves, a den of robbers. The chief priests and legal experts heard this and tried to find a way to destroy him. They regarded him as dangerous because the whole crowd was enthralled at his teaching. And when it was evening, Jesus and his disciples went outside the city. Again, they don't stay inside. And they leave again. Okay? Now, there's a lot we could say on each of these. We could spend, y'all know, we could spend five hours just on the flipping the tables and the in the, in the temple. Have you ever noticed, not in Mark, but in the other ones, he drives away the animals, but he doesn't drive away the birds. Because what are the birds for? Who offered birds? The poor. Mary and Joseph offered birds. You see? Now, that's not, it's not only an economic thing, but I just, it's an interesting detail. Um, it's an interesting detail. And when he flips the, when he flips the table, well, I'm not going to go into that. I'll start preaching. So, <laughs> all right. Now we go to the next day. Well, let me just say this real quick. All right. We talk all the time about Jesus as King, and He is, and He always will. We talk very little about Jesus as priest, but He is. He's our high priest. He prays for us right now. Right? He always will. But we almost never talk about Jesus as our prophet. <coughs> but he is our prophet, priest, and king. Okay? Because he's our prophet, we shouldn't be surprised that the things he does are just like the things the prophets in the Old Testament because we all the time we look at David and we think, well, Jesus is a greater David. He is. Or we look at Jesus as um, a greater Melchizedek, a priest, and he is. But he's also the great prophet. And, he, and not just, just a prophet. Of course, he's the son of God. But he's a prophet. And that means he's like a greater Jeremiah, a greater Ezekiel, a greater Isaiah. Do you remember that Isaiah, really all the prophets, they will do something... They will do something practical in real life that everyone can see as a demonstration of what God's going to do. They do something practical in front of everybody for everyone to see as an example of what God's going to do. This is what people, um, Bible scholars call this uh, prophetic sign acts. So here's some examples. Hosea, what does Hosea do? Right at the beginning. He marries a prostitute. And some people go, whoa, that's in the Bible? But if you read it, Hosea, why? Because he's saying this is what God does for us. Because we're the prostitute. Because we've ran away with other lovers instead of God. And he marries us. So Hosea does this as an example to say this is what God does for us. Right? Uh, here's another one that gets people in trouble. You don't, and I must, you don't want to do this in a, a, a little kid's Bible class. In, 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 in some places uh, in Judaism, they don't let kids read the whole Bible until they're uh, bar mitzvah. And then some even older, they wait until they're 30 to read Song of Songs. That's another song. But, okay, Isaiah. You know Isaiah was naked for a long time. You know what? I don't know, it was a couple of years. You know why? Just to be crazy and the people laugh at him? No. Because he wanted to show people this is what Israel's going to be like. This is what Jerusalem is going to be like when Babylon comes in and takes over. So he's showing everybody and demonstrating in his own person, in his own actions, he's showing a picture of something bigger that's going to happen. So as he's naked, he's saying Jerusalem's going to be naked. It's going to be stripped. It's going to be torn. It's going to be taken. Right? Just like Hosea marrying a prostitute is saying, God also marries us who are prostitutes spiritually. Okay? All right, so if that's in the background, and all the prophets do this, right? Amos talks about the, the plumb line and, and all different things, and uh, Ezekiel talks about cutting hair, and a third of the hair that exists, a third of it. They're all examples of demonstrations of what God's going to do. So if you think about that, then when Jesus flips the tables, and then in, a, in the Gospel of John, he has a whip, and he, and he whips out the, the money changers and the animals. What's that? 
What's a demonstration? In 40 years from then, the temple will be flipped over. Not only that, the whole city of Jerusalem will be flipped over. And not just animals and money changers will be whipped to get away, but the Roman army is going to come in and they're going to kill every single person in that city. And so he's showing this is what is going to happen. Okay. All right. So now we go to Tuesday. Any questions so far? I know this is a big overview, but I just want us to see the last week of his life. And then remember, at the end, we're going to look at how it lines up with Genesis 1, Sunday's creation. Because this is a new creation. But, um, all right, Tuesday. All right, so now we're at Tuesday. Okay? All right. This is chapter 12. No? No, it's not. Verse 20, sorry. Verse 20, early in the morning, as Jesus' and disciples were walking along, they saw the fig tree withered from the root up. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look how the fig tree you cursed has dried up. And Jesus responded to them, Have faith in God, I assure you, that whoever says to this mountain, Be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and doesn't waver, but believes that what is said will really happen, it will happen. Therefore I say to you, whatever you pray and ask for, believe that you will receive it, and it will be so for you. Whenever you stand up to pray, if you have something against anyone, forgive, so that your Father in heaven forgives your wrongdoing. All right, Tuesday has... Tuesday and Saturday... Sorry, Tuesday and Friday have the longest sections. Tuesday is really long. It's so long, in fact, we're not going to read all of it. And when you look at it, because Tuesday is all of chapter 12, 13, and 14. And when you look at it, you're actually going to see things that you have read all of your life, you have heard all of your life. I have too. And honestly, I had not even realized until quite recently, this stuff was happening. What? Four days, what, three days before he died. We don't think about that. We, sometimes when we hear readings from the gospel, we forget where it was in his life, in the timeline. And we also forget where it was. And we also forget who was there. And all those things matter. The who, what, when, where. And so, um, okay. And so this is the first part. So the, the, the fig tree is withered up. All right. All right. So last time... On Monday, you had a fig tree, and you had the temple, right? All right, and that was the connection, right, on Monday. Remember? You just saw it. Now we're on Tuesday. We're back at the fig tree again. Peter goes, boy, that's, that thing withered up, buddy. That thing, whew, that's done. But what's the comparison? What's the next thing brought up? Not the temple, but... Mountain, right? Okay? Now here's the thing. It's all connected. It's all connected. It's all connected. Because in the Old Testament, and well, both Testaments, the temple is, you cannot separate the temple from what? Mount Moriah and Mount Zion. Remember? Mount Zion is the greatest, highest, lifted up mountain. Even though in, if you went there today, it's not that high. But spiritually, it's the highest, it's the biggest, it's the greatest. It's where you go to meet with God. And the temple is on a mountain. It's on the temple mount. The mount. Right? Because in the Bible, you always go on the mountain to meet with God. All right? And all my life, I have heard people say, if you pray to move mountains, if you pray to move mountains, and move mountains, and Jesus talking about moving mountains, and I always thought, what in the world does that mean? And I was picturing a physical mountain, like Grandfather Mountain, and if you pray hard enough, Grandfather Mountain will come up in the air and go somewhere else. I've heard so many explanations of this verse. I've heard people say that back in those days, um, if there was a village that lived on a mountain, and the village moved somewhere else, you would say the mountain moved or something. I've heard so many things about this. But as I've studied this more, what I've come to understand is let the Bible interpret the Bible. The temple is always talked about as a mountain. 
You always meet with God on the mountain. And so if the last time the fig tree was connected up with the temple, and this time it's mentioned right next to a mountain, and Jesus is saying if you have faith to move a mountain, and by the way, in Revelation, do you remember, I think one of the seals was that a mountain was thrown into the ocean. Remember that one? Ooh, that's a connection, isn't it? Because what's, what's the ocean? In the Bible, ocean is the Gentiles, and the land is Israel. So if a mountain's thrown into the ocean, symbolically in the Bible, what that means is a temple or an altar is being thrown into the nations, into the water of chaos, which means judgment, because it's always the nations that bring judgment. Babylon, Egypt, you know, um, Syria. So all that to say, when Jesus is talking about moving mountains, what he's saying is, this temple's got to go. It's got to go. It's got to go. And he wasn't the only one who thought that. Remember the Dead Sea Scrolls? Dead Sea Scrolls, remember that? Discovered in 1948. And when we found those, you know what we've discovered is that there was a whole group of Jews at the time of Jesus that we knew nothing about. The New Testament doesn't talk about it. We didn't know about it. We knew about the Pharisees, we knew about the Sadducees, but we didn't know about this other group that now we're called the Essenes. And what the Essenes were is a lot of them were priests, or some of them were priests, not all of them. And they rejected the priests that were at the Temple of Jerusalem. This is a whole story we can't get into, but the long story short is at the time of Jesus, the priests who were in the Temple, you know how they got there? And I'm not making this up. And if if you think human nature is, if you think the world now is worse than it used to be, do you know how those priests got in that temple? They went to Rome, and before that, they went to Alexander the Great, and they said, How many? How, how much money do you want? And could you make me high priest? And they would strike a deal. And they weren't even Levites. They weren't even of the line of the priest. They weren't even of the priest. Line. There was a Benjaminite who went to one of the kings and just said, how much can I pay you? And not only that, it wasn't how much I can pay you, it's how high do I need to raise the taxes for all of it? I'm not making this up. They said, I'll make all of Israel pay higher taxes if you make me high priest. Makes a deal. And then that guy's brother came and said, I'll raise the taxes even higher if you make me high priest and kick my brother out. That's what they were doing. That's why Jesus acts so ugly with the priest. It's not because he doesn't honor authority. Of course he does. They're not true authority. They're fake. They, they, they paid. They paid money to do this. So, anyway, it's longer than we need. The point is, move this mountain. Get it out of here. Move the temple. Get it out of here. That's why he uh, cleansed the temple on Monday. Because there's going to be a new temple that comes. This temple that's, that's there right then, God's presence wasn't there. Uh, God had rejected it. So that's the mountain. Um, And then, like I said, Tuesday is really long. So it goes all of chapter 12 and all of chapter 13. And it goes, yeah, so so half of 11 and then all of 12, all 13. So some of the things you have there is, um, well, you have... Verse 27, Jesus and his disciples enter Jerusalem again. So now they go to Jerusalem again. And as Jesus was walking around the temple, the chief priests, legal experts, and elders came to him and they asked, what kind of authority do you have for doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? All right, we all know this passage. We've all heard this all the time. Remember they ask him, you know, what authority uh, did you have for this? And, And he says, well, I'll just ask you a question in exchange. You know, was John's baptism heavenly or of human origin? Remember, we, we all know this. But here's the thing, the context. Why do they, why do they want to ask him his authority right now? Because 12 hours ago, he just ransacked the temple. He just flipped those tables. That guy is back. And that guy's going to start a riot. And that guy, he just, he just made that absolute scene. That guy is an absolute insurrectionist. And now that he's back, we gotta figure, we gotta set it straight. And that's why here on Tuesday, everyone's gonna come up with a question. Everyone's trying to trap him. This person's trapping, this person's been trapping, this person's been trapping. And what you're gonna see is trapping all over the place. So they're asking, what's your authority? And then in, re- in reply, he speaks to them a parable. 
A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it. Now, we're not going to go into that. We've studied that before. What's the vineyard? It's Israel. What's the fig tree? It's Israel. Do you see the, see the connection? So then he tells his parable. And then he gets asked about taxes. And this is that famous passage, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's, right? But that question, again, is trying to trap him. If he gave the wrong answer about Caesar and taxes, he could have gotten arrested by the Romans over here, or he, got, or he could have gotten killed by the mob over here. If he's too lovey-dovey with Caesar, the mob could have killed him. But if he was too anti-Caesar, the guards would have arrested him. So they're trying to trap him. And oh, every time he gives the perfect answer no one expected and the perfect question, and he gets out of it. And again, why are they trying to trap him? Because this is the guy who just disrupted everything in the temple. Did you hear about the guy who flipped that table? That's what, they're, that's what they're talking about. He came in on the donkey. We thought he was the Messiah, but then he did all this crazy temple stuff. We don't know about him. Then the Sadducees come, and they want to ask about the resurrection. And what you see is that every single group is going to ask him a question. So the Pharisees come, they ask him this question. Um, the, uh, and then the, the Herodians, verse 13, with the taxes... And now verse 18, the Sadducees want to ask. And then verse 28, a legal expert wants to come and ask, which commandment is the most important? Okay. All right, so here, let me me put a modern-day example. Modern-day example. I ride in, and this isn't a perfect analogy, I go into Washington, D.C., and I go in on Air Force One. What is this guy doing? What? I go in Washington, D.C., Air Force One. And then somehow I get into Congress and I flip the table. I mean, I'm not, this isn't suggested. I don't think anyone should do this. I'm just making an example. Okay, well, this person disrupted things at the temple or something. And then the next day, everyone's in a question. So now a Republican comes and questions me. Now a Democrat comes and questions me. Now an Independent comes and questions me. Now a British person comes and questions me. Now, you know, I don't know, someone from Japan comes and questions me. You see, one person from each group wants to test, test me after that. So that's, that's what's happening to him. And then so he's asked, the, what's the greatest commandment? And we all remember that one. Then he's asked, which one is David's son? Uh, and then he, he does that. Then, verse 13, no, sorry. Um, then he talks about, oh, the, the widow's offering. Beware of the scribes and the Pharisees. And then the widow's offering. You know, look at her offering. Look at what she's giving. Now, he's close to the temple because she's giving that offering right at the temple gates. And then, verse uh, chapter thir- 13, as Jesus left the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look. What awesome stones and buildings referring to the temple. Look at that temple. Look how beautiful it is. And it was beautiful. Do you know in the ancient world, in the, in the Roman Empire, they said that the temple of Jerusalem was more beautiful than any temple in, in the whole empire. And these people who weren't Jews said this. Said it's more beautiful than the temples to Zeus in Rome or Paulo or whatever. This is the most beautiful one. So the disciples said, Jesus, this is beautiful, isn't it? It's so beautiful. Remember, Jesus' disciples, they're not from Jerusalem, so we don't know how often they would have gone anyway. They're all from up north in Galilee and so forth. It's so beautiful. Jesus, isn't that beautiful? My goodness. That's, oh. And he says, yeah, it is, isn't it? No, that's not what he says. What does he say? Somebody, what does he say? Not one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Now, what does that refer back to? It refers back to the fig tree being withered. It goes back to the mountain being moved. Literally, if you would have been there that day when the temple map was being thrown down, it would have looked like a mountain being thrown down. If you look at pictures of where it was, because the western wall, the waiver wall is still there, right? Literally, you're looking up, it looks like a mountain. And the stones that the Roman soldiers threw down, they were tons and tons and tons. How in the world are these guys, these soldiers... 
I mean, it's like a school bus, stone, thrown down, multiple of those. That's the mountain being thrown down. That's when, when he flipped the tables, that's representing this whole temple being flipped. Okay? Not one stone will be left on another. And then Jesus went to sit on the Mount of Olives. So again, he retreats back to the Mount of Olives. That's where he keeps returning to, right? He's going to go back there and go back there and go back there over and over. And why is the Mount of Olives important? Because there's a lot of reasons. That's a whole other sermon. Zechariah says that's where the Messiah is going to come from. It's also on the east side because the presence of God is going to come from the east. It's also the Mount of Olives. Olives. Why does why olives matter? Olive branch. Noah, the ark, the olive branch. Dry ground. You know why else? Because the temple and the tabernacle were made of three types of wood. And I think there are also, there's also silver, gold, and refined gold. So in the temple and tabernacle, there are three tiers of materials. There's basically the worst wood, the medium wood, and the best wood. And the worst metal, the medium, and the best. So silver, medium, gold, and, and refined gold. And then, uh, then it was uh, cypress. Then I think it was cypress, then cedar wood, and then olive wood. The Holy of Holies was made of olive wood. It's the holiest wood. So are we surprised that Jesus is on the mount of the holiest wood? It's like the Holy of Holies mountain. And even though the Bible is not exactly clear... Uh, many think that Jesus, when he died on the cross, that the cross was in the Mount of Olives, which wouldn't be that surprising because the cross is his throne. He's enthroned on the cross. And an olive is the Holy of Holies wood. So he's th- enthroned on the Holy of Holies mountain. Anyway, that's one other thing. So anyway, he goes back to Mount of Olives. And now chapter 13 is still Tuesday. In, in this chapter 13 is really long, and it's really long in Matthew also. And this is what has been called the Olivet Discourse. That's the fancy name for it. If you, if you look it up online, it's the Olivet Discourse. Olivet meaning Mount of Olives. And this is where he makes all of his prophecies about the end of the temple, the end of Jerusalem. And the judgments that's going to come upon Jerusalem in 70 by the Roman uh, military. Um, but also, and we talked about this before, also those prophecies point forward to the, to the very end as well. So, um, so we're not going to go into that because we don't have time. And then at the very end, chapter 13, uh, learn this parable from the fig tree. After its branch becomes tender and it sprouts new leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, you know that he, he's near at the door. I assure you, this generation won't pass away until all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words certainly not. Okay, we'll go into that. But notice again the fig tree again. The fig tree. Okay, now we go to Wednesday. Chapter 14 is Wednesday. It was two days before the Passover. And the festival of unleavened bread, the chief priests, legal experts, um, through cunning tricks, were searching for a way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But they agreed that it shouldn't happen during the festival, otherwise there would be an uproar among the people. So Jesus was at Bethany visiting the house of Simon, who had a skin disease. And during dinner, a woman came in with a vase of alabaster and containing very expensive perfume and anointed his feet. Remember this? Anointed his feet. And Jesus on Wednesday doesn't go into Jerusalem. He doesn't go into Jerusalem on Wednesday. And he doesn't go into Jerusalem on Thursday until uh, basically midnight when he's arrested. So he's, he's going to take a hiatus from Jerusalem. But it's a, you know why? Because he knows at this point they want to kill him. Because what just happened on Tuesday? The whole day he was there, they're trying to catch him. He knows that. You know, he knows 
He's a hair's breadth away from getting arrested by the Romans. I mean, he's a hair's breadth away from getting beat up by the, the mob over here. He knows that. So he's not going to go back into Jerusalem. Well, until he does. But he's not going to just walk in there. He's going to get arrested, and they're going to bring him to <coughs> but, but he knows at this point, if he walks in, they're going to take him. He knows at this point it's a matter of time. It's a matter of time. Now, he's not hiding either, and we know that, but he doesn't go back in until he's arrested. So he's anointed in, in Bethany um, by that per, uh, sweet perfume. This was a way of anointing those before burial. Remember, and he says, you know, what she's done for me will be remembered for all generations because she knew that he was going to die. And how many times has he told his disciples, I'm going to die and rise on the third day? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, Peter goes, no, 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 I have a better plan. You know, get thee behind me, Satan. So this woman knows better than most of his disciples and actually believes when he says, I'm going to die. Um, I'm going to be handed over. So she anoints his feet. And then Judas, uh, remember, he says, you know, why are we doing this? We should give this money to the poor. And then at the end of Wednesday... Wednesday night, Judas goes off to betray <coughs> Jesus. Judas goes off to talk to chief priests and says, you know, I know where he is, you know, and all that, and strikes up the deal with them. This is, by the way, why I've told y'all that John Wesley, the early Methodist, he didn't let any preacher be a preacher if they didn't fast every Wednesday and Friday until 4 p.m. Okay? So he would have kicked me out because I haven't. I try. I do fast a, 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 some, a number of Fridays. I try to do a Friday, but but I don't do that every Wednesday Friday. So he would kick me out. But he, you know why he does Wednesday Friday? Two reasons. One, because he had a high view of the early church when the early church had beliefs that did not contradict the scripture because he holds scripture above. But if the early church doesn't contradict scripture. He really wants to see what they have to say. In the early church, they fasted. A lot of them fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays. And the reason is to remember that he was betrayed on Wednesday and he was killed on Friday. Okay? Betrayed on Wednesday, killed on Friday. So Wednesday night, Judas betrays him. So then we go to Thursday. I'm going to go a little bit faster now. Um, because now that we're going to the end of the week, we all know this stuff better. Right, We don't know. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday is a little fuzzier, I think, for us. But now we, we all know this stuff pretty well. So you go to Thursday. He has his Passover meal. Um, Peter denies him. And, uh, and then he has the prayer uh, in Gethsemane. Notice he's still not in Jerusalem. He's still not in. Wednesday he's not. And still right now he's not. Um, but then he's praying in Gethsemane. He takes Peter, James, and John with him uh, to a special place and, you know, stay awake and pray. And then he is arrested. And then he's brought before the council. And Peter denies him. And then you move to Friday. Of course, Friday you have the trial. Or sorry, you have the uh, pilot bringing him. And you, he releases Barabbas, you know, and all that uh, early in the morning. And then he's scourged, mocked. Uh, beaten, spat upon, stripped, the crown of thorns, and then he is put up on the cross. And, of course, there is a lot there. You know, the Gospel of Mark, if you combine everything, if you combine his time, his cross, the cross and resurrection, I think it's more than almost half of Gospel of Mark takes place in and around Jerusalem this last week of his life. Uh, because there's just so much that happens. So we, we all know the story on Good Friday. And next week, please come to the Good Friday service because it's a really powerful service. And it's the one service where we read through the whole story. And it's important to be able to hear the whole story in one sitting. Hear the whole thing and remember what he did for us. So um, And come to the Monday, Thursday service. Remember the Last Supper too. And then you have Holy Saturday. On your sheet, it says Silent Saturday, but it's also called Holy Saturday. Joseph of Arimathea comes to Mary Magdalene, and some of the women take his body down, put him in a tomb in the garden. 
And, uh, and then you have Easter Sunday. So that is Holy Week. Um, we're going to wrap up here, but any questions as we walk through it before we just do a quick look at Genesis 1 and think about the first week in the Bible and then the last week of his earthly ministry? But any, any questions on this? Again, we all know these stories, but to be able to put them in order is kind of helpful. And what I want you to do with this handout is next week, as we walk through Holy Week and we, we remember all of these things He did for us and all these things that happened, you might want to take the sheet and read one of these scriptures um, or more than one for each of the days of the things that He did and said. And just to pray for each of these days and give Him thanks for the things He did on each of those days. Okay? So you just take this home and, and look over and, and use it to pray next week. And, and please come on uh, Thursday and Friday. And then we have our day of prayer on Thursday. So any questions or comments on that? Day of what did I just say? Thursday. On, fr- <laughs> on Friday. I need help on Friday. On Friday. Any questions? So, how in the world does this have to do with Genesis 1? Well, that, I, I would take a whole other night for that. Uh, we don't have time right now. Except for me to just say a couple things. Um, one is that he comes in on a donkey on the first day. Um, he comes and appears. And, and who is Jesus, by the way? The light of the world, isn't he? He says, I am the light of the world. And then he calls us to be the light of the world. The light of the world comes into the city. And if you listen to his preaching, he's basically saying, Jerusalem is full of darkness. And now the lights come in the darkness. That sounds like day one, doesn't it? Light and darkness. The donkey comes day one. And then day two, Monday, the second day, he flips that table in the temple. Now what's the temple? The temple is the meeting place between heaven and earth. What happens on day two of Genesis 1? God creates the world. The firmament, right? Remember the firmament? The, the, the vault between the waters above and the waters below. And it separates heaven and earth. Do you know that day two in Genesis 1, you know how after each day it says, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. Day two is the only day it does not say it's good. You can check now. Go and look. It's the only day. It doesn't matter what Bible translation you have. There is no Bible that says on day two it was good. Because it wasn't good. And why wasn't it good? Because he didn't want to separate heaven and earth. He did it provisionally at first. But at the very end of the end, there's no separation of heaven and earth. He brings them together. Now how does he do that? He does it in himself because Christ is the heaven on earth person and he brings the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, and the new earth. So you go home and check in on that Genesis 1. It doesn't say it's good on day 2. So he flips the table in the temple. Why? Because he, what's he saying? The temple is not good. It was made good. It was made for a good purpose, but it's fallen into disarray. And the temple was supposed to be where heaven and earth meet. Just as the firmament was supposed to be where the he- heaven and earth are separated and there's a boundary and it's a, it's a neat way of kind of, of bifurcating the two. So on day two, you have where heaven and earth meets the temple. On day three, what does God create? Remember? The dry land. And then after he creates the dry land, what comes, what does he do? He brings the grasses, and the fruit-bearing trees are out of the earth. What happens on Tuesday, day three, whole week? The fig tree, the fig tree, the fig tree, the fig tree. That's what we're talking about. See that connection? Fig tree. Where's that fruit on that fig tree? On day three, Genesis 1, fruit, fruit, fruit-bearing trees, fruit. You see? All right, day four. Now this one, this word gets a little tricky. I, I don't even know how this one connects, honestly. Day four, sun and the stars. Day four, he's anointed, his feet are anointed, and Jews betrays him. 
I don't, I'm not quite sure on that. Uh, you, have, you definitely have a greater light and a lesser light. You have Jesus, the greater light. He's anointed. You know what anointing does? It makes things even brighter. If you have oil on your face, you walk in a bright room, your face is shining even brighter. But he's the sun of righteousness. Judas is the dim, dark moon. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how to catch that one exactly. Then you have Monday, Thursday, the fifth day. What happened on the fifth day in Genesis 1? Remember? God creates. Not yet. Yeah, animals. God, because look, he just created some of the stars. He hasn't created any animals yet. So day five, he creates animals. He does, remember, the fish in the sea, the filled sea, and the birds of the sky. And I think the creepy things as well. And, but the point is, have you ever seen a school of fish? And it looks like a cloud. It looks like a cloud, but when you look at the place, you see all the different ones, right? Same thing with birds. If you see birds migrate, it looks like a big cloud. But it turns out it's a bunch of, it, it's a ton of them, but they're being led by one. There's one is leading, like geese, right? And if, this, if the leading goose, wherever he goes, she, that's where they all go. This is a school of fish. And who are they following? The one in the center. The goose. The lead goose. They're a group, a school of fish, a cloud of birds. But anyway, that's, that's the best I can figure. I know that's a little bit of a stretch maybe. But, um, also, well, this is a whole other thing, but on the fifth day, in ancient Judaism, they understand the fifth day as uh, signifying when Moses gave the law. What does Jesus give on the um, last supper? Gives the new covenant. This is my blood of the new covenant. All right, so now the next day, the sixth day, is what? Man. Now, remember I told you Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John actually give us hints that, uh, that, that Genesis 1 is connected with the last week of Jesus' life? And I know maybe some of you are going, yeah, yeah. Let me tell When Pilate gets Jesus before the crowd, remember how we... Remember, Pilate says, look, I like, I'm a nice guy. I like to release someone. Do you want Jesus, king of the Jews, to be released? Or do you want Barabbas? Remember when he does that? But in the, only in the Gospel of John. When he releases and shows Jesus to everybody, you know what he says? Only in John. He says, behold the man. It's only in John. Now, why is that important? Because you know in Genesis 1, it says, it says God creates such and such. And, and it was there. You know, God said, let there be light, and there was light, right? And it was good. Now, if you keep looking at Genesis and you walk through, this is amazing. This kind of stuff, I can't even sleep anything about this stuff. And then Rachel goes, shh, shh, shh. When it gets to day six, and you go read it, he says, I make, you know, make man of my own image, man and woman, I make him. But he doesn't say, and there was man. So, let there be light, and there was light. Man and woman, my, uh, man and my image, man and woman, blah, blah. But he doesn't say, and there was man. In the Gospel of John, when Pilate shows Jesus, he says, behold the man. In other words, what's John trying to say? This is the first truly human being who's ever shown his face on the earth. All the others have sinned and fallen. They're not the true, perfected human. He is. This is the one. This is it. Behold the man. You know what that would have been in the original? Behold Adam, the true Adam. This is him. Here he is. This is him. All right. Now, so, humanity created on day six. That's what Pilate says, behold the man. Day seven, Genesis 1, what is it? Rest? Okay. What are you going to do tonight? I hope you sleep. I hope I sleep tonight. I had a big problem last night. Ooh. I have ice sleep tonight. Now, what is sleep always connected with in the Bible? Rest. Rest. Dreams. Dreams. Think. Sometimes they Death. What happens on day six? Holy. Part to ask. He's in the tomb. You, you get it? Rest. He's resting in the grave. Not for long. 
And then the eighth day. And it's important we say the eighth day because it's the second first day. Because it's the first day of new creation. The one who rested, the king who's sitting at the, who's, who's accomplished everything. He says it's finished. And he rides from the earth. So, anyway, I hope that uh, you learned something tonight. Any questions or comments? All right, let's stand and, and pray the Lord's Prayer again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Y'all have a blessed night and, uh, and I'll see you on Sunday. Take this paper home. This last week of Lent, uh, commit. Uh, time with the Lord. Pray, read scripture, and then next week, you can use this sheet uh, to remember his last uh, week of his ministry.